Bruchim Aboyim. Thank you for coming. The topic of tonight's lecture, lecture is uh, who are you? Who really defines who we are? Um, there's a story told in, uh, about a king. He had a very wise advisor who was the astrologer. And he came to the king and he told him that next year's wheat, there would be something in the wheat that would make everybody crazy. So he suggested that what the king should do is to store up enough grain in the silos around the palace so that the king and his attendants would all be sane because the people would be crazy by eating the wheat. So this way they would protect the king. And the king looked at the advisor and said, you're really not so smart. The advisor said, what do you mean? He said, if we're sane and everyone else is crazy, then we're going to be crazy and everyone else is going to be sane. So whatever they're eating, we'll eat. And we'll go through the same thing together. In Pirkei Avos, I think chapter 3, the Hanina Mendoza says that if people love you, God loves you. And if people don't love you, then God has a problem with you. So it seems to show that who you are is defined by others, which is interesting because many times people don't see you the same way that you do. And not only that, we know we have secular and religious viewpoints. So how do we really define who we are? In general, if the world's perception of you is different than yours, generally you're the one who's the problem. So if everyone seems to see you in a certain way. If you see yourself as a very giving person, then the world doesn't. Or you see yourself as a very calm person, and the world seems you as an angry person. It really is time for a person to be introspective and to look within himself to decide. If, somebody, if people see me this way, there must be something wherever there is a seed. There must be something happening. You know, it says in the uh, Parsha of Pinchas that the nations were saying lies about the nation of Israel. And they were saying that they did not have a pure genealogy, that they had been raped, that they had relations with the Egyptians, and all the Jews that came out of Egypt had Egyptian blood. So what God did in the Parsha of Pinchas, he added a hey and a yud to the names of every one of the Jews that were mentioned, the families. And again, that's the name called God's name. To say that these people were pure, he, te he testified to that. So what's interesting is, so God did that in the Torah, but do the Gentiles, do the non-Jews study Torah to know? So what it is is that Torah gives us the tools to be able to overcome our enemies, strong and resolute beliefs in ourselves to know what's true. So where we find our truth about who we are is in the Torah. Now sometimes people confuse tolerance with submission, flexibility with concession, and peace with surrender, which is not the case. The, we see that Moshe Rabbeinu, when Korach had his rebellion and other times in the Torah when people came up against Moshe and tried to rebel against him in any way, Especially with Korach, it says he fell on his face. Why? And the answer is that he wasn't sure. He first wanted to take a diagnostic test, if you will, to see whether Korach was either sent by God or whether Korach's points were legitimate. And maybe he was wrong. So before he opposed Korach, he first did an analysis himself to make sure that he was doing what God wanted, what was the correct thing to do. And then he came and confronted Korach because he knew that it was not, what he was doing was correct. Many times when we are around people, we act differently around different people. Uh, men that are around attractive women, they don't listen to anything she says necessarily. It just they have a different thought in mind and their agenda is just to be accepted or to have favors from the woman. It's interesting, I sometimes look at old women and they say, would say very stupid things and laugh 
and think that it was funny, and no one else did. And it struck me very strange until I realized that when they were younger, they were probably very attractive. And those things that they said then, men laughed at, though they weren't funny or cute. But it wasn't important that it was funny or cute. It was only important that the woman liked them, and they were able to make some inroads into what their goal was. So you're different people sometimes around, around others. Um, when you're around nice people, many times you're nice. And when you're around s smart people, many times you're not talking, you're listening because they just overwhelm you with their intelligence. Wealthy people many times get credibility. It's interesting, there was a man who was very wealthy. His house was a circus. I mean, people coming all the time, calling all the time. He needed a revolving door. And he lost his money. And he said to his wife, because the house got very quiet, nobody called, nobody came. He said, I know when I lost my money, but when did I lose my seichel? When did I lose my intelligence? So many times it's the wealth that gives credibility. And people act differently around a rich person than they do around a person who is poor. When you're home versus work, again, two different things. Um, especially dealing with a spouse. When we deal with strangers, many times we have patience. And we don't really let out the real person who we are. There's a saying that says, if you want to know if a person is religious, there's only two people that know. God and his wife. Because there is an open relationship. People don't hide things. And it's hard, too, because you're with the person all the time. So they get to know you in a different way. At the same time, many times friends you can have a relationship with and you accept their faults and you just deal with it and you kind of chuckle about it and maybe make jokes. Whereas a spouse, it's, it's all the time. So all of a sudden it rubs in a much different way. So the patience you may have for the world, you don't have for a spouse, which is not necessarily correct, but it's a reality. Not only that, history. You know what things were before. So even when a spouse tries to change their ways, you've already assumed that they're going to react in a way. So the way that we find out about what, things, what, what people think, and I tried this, ask someone, what can I do to improve on? Because if you ask people, what are my faults? I don't know if you're going to get an answer at all. But if you ask them, what can I improve on? You know, I'm trying to be a better person. What do you think I can improve on? You still find it difficult. You'll find it difficult to get an answer. I have two children. I asked one of them, and the, one of them said, nothing, Dad, you're, you're perfect. And the other one, he's still talking. <laughs> um, he had what to say. Um, so, but it's, you know, it, it's hard to know what's credible and what's not. And you have to remember, and you keep this in mind, if you're going to ask someone, what can I do to improve on? The problem also is they're going to turn around and ask you the exact same thing after you answer. And as, as uncomfortable as, you, as you've made them by asking that question, you will now be in the same place. So it's really hard to get an honest answer from people about who you are. So. A lot of times the way we find what we are and who we are is by the reaction that people have to us. But sometimes we think that we're very smart because no one argues with us. When we say something, people seem to accept it. The truth is someone said to me that I'm a hard guy to argue with. I said to him, because I'm right. <laughs> but the truth is that's not an answer because no one is necessarily right all the time. But we, or at least in my own mind, I'd like to believe that if someone has a truth that is greater than mine, not only will I accept it, but I'll embrace it and thank him for, for telling me. And when someone is right a lot of the time, people find that to be objective. Uh, it makes you a little less human. Many times when you see someone who seems to be right all the time, makes the right decisions, does the right things, 
you don't want him to fall, but you wouldn't mind if he stumbled a little because there's a problem by seeing people that are successful, so to speak, all the time. So it becomes a difficult thing to know. And then it says in the Torah that when Yaakov gave Shechem to Yosef for burying him and, and taking him from Egypt to Canaan to the, the Machpelah and Hebron, he said he gave him Shechem that he, that he captured Becharbi of Akashti with my, with my sword and with my bow. It's really backwards. If you're in battle, first you fight from a distance, so you'd use a bow, and then you'd go hand to hand and use a sword. Yaakov reversed the order. First the sword, then the bow. So I think that may have something to do with the fact that the real battle in life is the internal battle that we have with ourselves, with the evil inclination, the Yetzirah that lives within us. What happens when we're successful? Then all of a sudden the bow comes out and everything around us tries to tell us that we're wrong, that we're a zealot, that we're crazy, that we're not practical, we're not living in, in the right century, we're not living with the times, that we need to grow with things, be more um, accepting of the world, things have changed. And we know that's not the truth, that the Torah that God gave us is for all times and all places, not just for a certain time or dimension. So you have to be very careful. And what do we use? What's the litmus test? And the truth has to be two things. Number one is to look into the Torah. That is our instruction manual. To, and the Torah tells us to be an honest person. But what's very interesting is that that doesn't just mean honest in dealings with others, but honest with yourself. You need to honestly look at yourself. You need to honestly judge, just like Moshe, when he fell on his face, and analyze why it is someone has said something to you, and do they have merit? And we're all human. There are things that we could all work on. There are times when we do get angry, and there are times when we are not as kind as we should be, or we're not as considerate as we should be. And we should acknowledge that. And we should be quick to ask someone for forgiveness, quick to acknowledge that we've done something wrong. And if, even if we don't know who we are, we should know who we need to be. And that might be the real answer. Not who you are, but who do you need to be? What does God want you to be? What does he demand of you? Are you godly? Because that's really what it is. If you see someone you admire, you want to be like him. And there's nobody greater to be like than God. And that's what the whole book of the Torah is about, to learn to be godly. Truth is, my idol, the person that I admire more than anyone else, is my evil inclination, Satan. Never gives up, just keeps coming. Never takes a day off, very humble. He gets it because perseverance, staying the course, success does not come from IQ. It doesn't come from being gifted. It comes from perseverance and he gets it. So how and who we should be, who are you is not important. Who should you be? What should you be? And whatever you are, and whoever you are, or you think you are, you need to look at that in the context of who is God. And as God is forgiving, you're forgiving. And as God is humble, you are humble. And as God is kind, you are kind. And all of those traits that God does, God visits the sick, God buries the dead, all of these things the Torah tells us. And if you're not doing that, and you don't feel that you're following that path, and the truth is, you're not who you should be. You're not who God wants you to be. You're missing the point. So remember, it's not who you are. It's who you should be. And the truth is, we're all working on it. Good luck. God bless and have a great Shabbos.